Good afternoon. I hereby call this agenda review meeting of the Nacogdoches ISD Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum is present and notice of this meeting was <coughs> posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. Board member James Oldman is unable to attend today's meeting. All items on the agenda today are for discussion only. No action will be taken at this meeting. Please join us now in turning your cell phones to the silent mode. We will uh, now discuss uh, items on the agenda. We'll begin with the consent agenda. Item 2A, uh, our board meeting minutes. Were there any questions or concerns on those? Ma'am, I believe I did have, if you allow me to open it. Absolutely, take your time. Yes, ma'am, is uh, item D, number four. And, and the minutes are on the consent agenda? The consent agenda. All right. All right, let me do this. Okay, hearing no concerns about the board minutes, we'll move on to item 2B, business office reports. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, Mr. Naramond, if it would be okay, can we go ahead and let her present and then sure, we can field absolutely. questions? Absolutely. All right. Mrs. Barber. Uh, can I request a little more time for my computer to do <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if you can. Um... We can get there on um, it's page 18 in our board book. All right, so um, first of all, we have budget amendments. The first budget amendment is from the high school and they are moving funds uh, from instruction to uh, pay for students' travel costs to UIL events. The second budget amendment is for TJR uh, request, moving funds from in, uh, instruction to uh, curriculum and staff development for teachers to attend staff development. Oh, as, I'm sorry, that included uh, Function 23 school leadership. They're pulling from two different places. Um, Budget Amendment C, we are pulling funds from fund balance. Um, this is the second half payment for our school dude solutions, which is a maintenance software projecting out um, needs um, for future years. And we pulled the first payment out last year, and this is the second payment. Budget Amendment D, 
is pulling funds from fund balance to upgrade the police radio system. Theirs is very old, and antiquated, and uh, doesn't always work. And so we are uh, recommending pulling out of fund balance to upgrade their radio system. Budget E, uh, yeah, Budget Amendment E is pulling 90000 which is an estimate, to pay for, um, to upgrade or replace our audiovisual equipment at the high school. Madam President, let me, uh, I know we're going to need to revisit that number. Uh, <coughs> it is an estimate, but, that, but we will need uh, more than that just for the high school part. As we discussed, we have the, hi the high school uh, auditorium, the gym, and then TGR. Mm -hmm. TGR is from bond funds. These two are, are from the fund balance we're looking at. So we'll need to look at that, that number again and have that number ready for you guys uh, on Thursday. So it'll be a different number then? Yes, sir. Okay. And you recall we uh, discussed with you all items uh, uh, <coughs> C, D, and, and E as well. Correct. In the earlier meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, budget Amendment F is um, a request from the high school pulling funds from instruction to um, staff development for their staff to have professional development. And finally, Budget G is um, just a little bit of cleanup um, on uh, staff that um, I can't pinpoint a particular staff person, but in Function 13, our curriculum and staff development, I just need about 3,000 more just to clear up negative balances. Will that be enough to go through the, the year? I believe it will be. It will, I, I'll be honest that it will be close, <laughs> but. Um, so any questions on budget amendments? Any more questions on budget amendments? All right. Next we are on page 24, and that is our, uh, donations, gifts and donations under $2,500. And um, Malcolm Rector Technical High School received $1,500 to go towards buying a washer and dryer that they intend for their students to use. Very nice. Yes. And that came from Lowe's. Nothing irregular on the investment reports, but if you have any questions, I'll answer them. I saw that we got um, uh, like 2% or something like that on our money, and, and we, we uh, let's see, we income earned was almost uh, 40, how many? 40, 45, 40. Almost 46. That's a good job. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I deserve any kind of record. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But we do watch it. All right. And then following 28 further are just our regular business reports, check registers. Do you have any questions on those? I believe this is uh, Mr. Nirmon had a question. I'm no, no, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Mine was E. Oh, E. Okay. Not there yet. All right. I did, uh, let me scroll down, Miss Barbaric. Are there any other questions in regard to the business office reports? when we get into our projects that there were a number of those you were closing out this month. Is that a correct, am I reading that correctly? Do you, can, what yep. page is that on? I'm getting there, let's see. Uh, for example, on page 66, under the high school uh, door replacement, I see a closeout listed there. I also see it on the ninth grade roof replacement close out. So I know several of those are older projects. That right. We, and and I, that, I believe your intent is we're 
we close them out, out and I, I, I get, when I get sure. right when I get verification from Mr. LaRue, then I can close I close it out and I just move it back <coughs> down into our future projects budget for Correct. right. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice that. Just wanted to make sure I was interpreting it correctly. So yes, you good. are. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, we will go to item C. Um, this is the communications, uh, new communication system for the police department. I believe we've discussed this previously in executive session, so we'll just uh, kind of move over this, unless anybody has any objections. Uh, item D is the sale of delinquent property. Mrs. Barber, can you, any notes here for us? This is um, just a routine transaction when we have property that, um, where they haven't been paying their taxes and this is one of them and we are um, recommending that we sell it to the bidder and uh, get it back on the tax rolls and start collecting funds. And the property is which property are we talked about? It is, it's on Power Street. Power Street. Mm -hmm. And based on who the owners are, um, it's an estate, it's someone who has passed away and it was a Miss Pruitt, and this lady's name is actually Roger Pruitt Henry. So it's probably a family member. Uh, is all this that's owed for the county and the city and the hospital district, that all goes away? We're the only one that gets money out of this, right? Well, actually, we will not get any money because it, uh, any proceeds we receive will go towards the expenses that have already been um, incurred. Okay, so basically we're, we're just saying, like we're, you said, we, we want to get it back on the tax rolls that's instead right. of being inactive. Okay. Yes. So then everybody will be back getting taxes. That's correct. That that's correct. Okay. I just, I just want to be clear. So by doing this, it allows that property to be taxed and included on our tax base for Correct. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Right now we are not receiving any taxes on it. Okay. Any additional questions? All right. We will move then to item E, which is the NHS 2019-2020 course guide, Dr. Hill. Sure, so you have a couple of documents in front of you, or actually in board book. One of them is just a list of the potential courses. Typically what happens is these courses that are proposed go on the course selection sheet and then we gauge student interest based off of that. So these are the courses at this juncture that we would like to offer for the 1920 school year. Uh, but we won't know for sure until we get all the uh, data back from the students and they're knowing their interest. <coughs> <coughs> Ms. Fitch, right, was, Mr. 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 Uh, I had a question. Sure. Uh, please enlighten me. In the past, as an athletic director, I would visit with the curriculum director and the principal <coughs> and come and also visit with the, every coach to see if their schedule is at such a time and period that does not interfere with the academic classes or minimums. At the same time, each coach is supposed to give me a, a so-called statement to put in the course catalog. For example, they say uh, athletics, during athletic classes, we do conditioning, skills, this, that, that, and we have, for example, uh, 50 for varsity and maybe 40 for JV. In other words, indicate that certain numbers. Therefore, the counselor would not put too many people in there. A lot of people, <coughs> instead of taking a PE, didn't want to be in, I call it general population, to want to be the specific, to be then when the, they realize what goes on, they want to change the schedule. And to prevent that, we came to a conclusion. As I review this one, it's not stated as such. Also, it's not only not stated, there's some inconsistencies, in my judgment. Okay. For example, some activities says it's non-credited. 
Okay, if you are in a physical education, you get a half credit. <coughs> if you're in athletic, you can replace that at half, half credit, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it says baseball, freshman baseball is a non-credit. Okay. How could it be? Now, if there is a person who takes athletics, he get credit, he cannot participate in PE because it's two, two elective, two PE at the same time, same semester. However, if they are in a fine art, for example, cheerleaders, they can get a fine art credit, and they're in the PE, they can get a PE credit or athletic credit. These things need to be sorted out. Sure. Also, our golf team or golf players, for participation, they have to drive their own vehicle to the golf course and visit with the coach over there. Is this, as far as safety, are we under any obligation for their safety of back and going back and forth? It's a great question. I do not know the answer to that. What I would what like us to do is, is get the questions, because a lot of these are <coughs> going to be campus answered more so than here. Yes. So if there are questions you have, let, let's get those questions, and we'll get those answers to you. Yes. Sure. And also, well, they're not here, but you can see. I looked at some of the athletic pages. They have two pages for varsity and JV. Some athletic, they have only one. Mm -hmm. And since I have been in an AD in the past, I get those phone calls mm -hmm. from the parents. Mm -hmm. And my response so far has been, this is not my responsibility. I'm not involved. That's the is correct it, response. Visit with the athletic director and the coach. Uh, exactly. The yes, sir. Exactly. So, Thing, things do tend to change over time. Yes. And when things change, if they have yeah. questions in this, in this, at this time, they should be directing those to the appropriate right. staff at the campus and not rely upon how things used to be as much. Yeah. Uh, I may deviate a little bit. Uh, as an athletic director, I used to get information on what goes on, what precautions to be taken. Mm -hmm. I believe it was when in Philadelphia, the baseball parents sued the school for four years of a scholarship and their justification was baseball had three coaches and their player, the baseball player, got enough uh, in so-called skill knowledge and game prepared to be able to get a full-time scholarship. Softball had only varsity and JV had one coach, therefore they didn't get enough attention to become college prospect. So we have to be very careful. There's always a somebody who finds something that wants to take advantage of it. The best thing to do, on my judgment, is be a uniform. If football has two periods, tennis has two periods, soccer has two periods, everybody has two periods for Boston and JV. Am I making sense? Well, that becomes a staffing issue as well as a student, a student course selection right. issue. We don't just create a course to create a course. If there's not demand for it, you don't need, you don't need two periods. It depends upon the demand. Well, well, well I understand, Mr. Freddy. I, my question is, or my concern is, offering a period for so-called JV and freshmen. Mm -hmm. Some sports is obviously different with other sports. Some sports require skills, mm -hmm. and those skills cannot get gain after school within two weeks then start in the district. There has to be a period that coaches and teachers teach those skills to those mm -hmm. students. And some of those sports are denied for that. So I'm getting one period. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Hill, just one question. Um, once the course catalog was approved by the board, how is it disseminated to the student staff? How is that done? Usually it's online. Um, I believe some, some copies are made available to parents if they request it. Um, <coughs> but primarily it's online. Okay. So, but we will definitely so parents have, have to request that if they don't have access to the internet? I'm almost positive, but please don't quote me on that. I did ask Dr. Crespo was here and I apologize. He had a, right. a speaker this morning. I'm just morning. concerned because if parents don't have that access and they don't sure. know that they can get a copy or how they go about getting it, I would like to make sure they have that access. Absolutely. My, my recollection is there's a form that goes home at the beginning of school to, in the packet and they actually have to sign it saying, okay. I want you to send home a hard copy or I will take responsibility for okay. accessing it online. My concern is probably going to piggyback right on that, though, that, um, you know, it making sure it's also available in Spanish. Right. I was, yeah. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can get yeah. a little tunnel vision sometimes. Did you have a question? No, I know. Everybody's kind of 
covered it all. Y'all have been really good at that. <laughs> 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 um, I did. I, I, I tell you, um, I, I think that uh, I read through this last night and knowing where we've been in the last couple of years in the, in the three years, it, it, it read very clean. I think that there was some areas that were tightened up okay. um, that were a little loose previously. So Great. good job. Whoever Great. whoever kind of took this project on, I know it's a big project. It's the high school. Uh, <laughs> they, they did they did great. Um, you know, and I was really impressed. I believe on page 180 are the new courses that you're talking about, correct? <laughs> um, and I was so exceptionally excited to see um, those additional AP class uh, music offerings, everything from you know, the computer science to uh, music theory, statistics, government. Uh, we're adding a, an option for American Sign Language 3, yes, uh, a graphic design level 2, uh, mill and cabinet making technology. I, I, I was, you know, uh, I just want to compliment you. Great job on adding these course offerings. I realize that some of them may make and some of them may not. Uh, make as far as enrolling students but uh, was really pleased to to see the new offerings thank you it's a great work on the high school staff no. yes, <coughs> all right any additional questions does, does the sign language is there any kind of inner inner interlacing relationship between sign language at the high school and with the university since they offered a degree in that or Ooh. it's just standalone I they believe it's standard. There's alone. no dual credit or anything. No, sir. Not, sure. at, this, not at this time. Not at this because I, I, I believe, I know I, I also was <coughs> noticing that there seems to be a lot more interlacing between what you can do now and, and get dual credit for at the college level. It, it, from when my daughter went through just two or three, two or three years ago, they've, they've done more interlacing, so they're definitely headed the right direction. Good. Do you, would you agree? I, I know I, you're. I do. I mean, and even what Jamie had two years ago, she knocked a year off of it of uh, college at SFA. So, you know, I mean, and now I see it even more. I mean, there's things that she was like, ah, now, you know. So mm -hmm. I think it's great. Thank you. Dr. Taylor, uh, those are students taking dual credit classes at college, those grades would refer to high school as a numerical number or letter number grade? They are numerical. Numerical? Yes. <coughs> But does uh, SFA also get a transcript of their own for their own record with the letter? That is correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. They tightened that area up in there too. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, just yes. And in, in the in the text, they really tightened the communication up on that. So good job. We had an issue with uh, communication several years ago. Yes. Sir. And uh, that was brought to our attention, my attention, just recently. Well. That this, since I've been here. And so after Hill's come on board and taking care of that to really tighten it up a whole lot, make sure that we have more consistency in what we do and that we have an articulation of what the process is. So. Very much so. Oh, there was one more thing. This graphic design uh, and illustration, that's going to link in with our scoreboard, right? Um, yes. I believe and that and advertising for our scoreboard. So mm -hmm. this is Smart. really good yeah. that that we're putting feet to what we've, what we've the future. For these children, for these students. It's a great program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Good catch. <laughs> yeah. So they even had the animation in there under the audiovisual track. So. And they can also do the signs out in front of the. Uh, the <coughs> you know that's going on now. Both signs are really great. Yeah, you may notice that we do have two digital signs at the high school now. One off Alpha Sand Road, one off East Alling. So. so we're happy about that. Thank you all for supporting that. Any more discussion on the course catalog? I know that was a lot to digest, a lot of pages to read. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, we will move on then uh, to item three, uh, discussion action items for Thursday night. Item A is the consideration of best value determination on method of construction services and delegation of authority. Thank you, Madam President. What this is looking at, uh, as we are going through the process of working through these projects and uh, trying to be very competitive with the bidding environment that we're going to find ourselves in, uh, you can do a competitive seal proposal uh, and, and take your, your chances with the market or a uh, construction manager at risk where you bring the construction manager or the construction <coughs> team on board 
in the early stages of the planning, so you have a better time with the pricing of things and the viability of projects. And architects love to draw things up and look real nice. Staff asks for a lot of different things, and we try to get a price estimate. This puts the construction team at the table doing these discussions. So I want to have Sam Savage, PBK, come up and talk more about what that is. We'll have some information. We'll get to you guys later on. <coughs> Mr. Savage? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me today. Thank you to the board, Madam President, Mr. Fraley. Um, really, uh, I believe you have in your packet a, um, some uh, stapled uh, pages, I believe. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go over those uh, basically uh, in note form. I'll, I'll run through these. There's a lot of information here. I'm not going to read every single word. Uh, but if there's anything you have, any questions, oh, okay, she's passing it out now, great. Uh, if there's any questions you have, please stop me and, uh, and ask me uh, whatever questions you have. And basically what we're talking about here today is uh, looking at what we're calling a construction manager at risk package. And you also uh, hear it uh, described as a CM at risk, same thing. Uh, it is a method, it is, it is a method that is approved by the state of Texas uh, for schools in Texas to uh, build projects. Uh, there's basically two different methods that uh, you usually use. Uh, one is, is basically a construction bid process, or we call it CSP, where we get competitively sealed proposals from different uh, contractors. The other is the this, this CM at risk, the construction manager at risk, and that's what we're talking about today. Uh, just, to, just to go down, and I'm, I'm reading right now off of the, uh, off of the first sheet, and, and again, please stop me if you have any questions. Uh, the selections are based on qualification first. So you would have a series of uh, construction manager at risk uh, firms that would basically send in their qualifications. We would look over those qualifications uh, and basically they would have only the costs which are called general conditions, which are the basic uh, conditions, the basic uh, project team, uh, you know, the cost for that personnel as well as their construction fees. Uh, there would be no other costs because we haven't established, we haven't completed the design process so we haven't completed that. So you're basically basing it on the fees and you're also basing it on their qualifications. What the type of work they've done before, uh, how many of they, these have they done, what their bonding capacity is, things like that. Um, on number two, the, <clears throat> the manager, the construction manager, would be part of the construction team. They'd be part of the project team, which is very important because we bring uh, that person on as a team member. They help us in determining the best way to do things. Sometimes we're looking at different ways to, uh, to build or design the structure of the building. The, uh, the CM, the construction manager, can give us uh, feedback on that so we can do that ahead of time so we can have that already in the documents. Uh, Pre-construction services, uh, just uh, basically the, the construction manager will sign a contract and they will also perform pre-construction services. So all the construction services prior to signing a contract for construction, the, the construction manager at risk would also be involved in, in doing that. So they'd be under contract. They're not doing it for free. They're doing it based on the fact that they are the member of this team. Uh, there's an open book process. All costs and fees are out in the open. And one thing that is really important is any savings are received back to the owner. And I've been in several construction manager at risk projects and there are savings that come back to the owner. So that's one really big thing that you don't get with a competitively sealed proposal bid type project. Um, uh, in today's market, probably one of the more important things and why are we, uh, why are we even looking at this? T today's market here, especially in this state, it, it is extremely busy. There's a lots of construction projects, a lot of projects uh, for schools going out uh, because schools is a big thing and, and the state of Texas is supporting that. Uh, the, it, with this market, it's harder to find qualified construction 
people in basically in other markets. So we would be looking at the Dallas market, also the Houston market as well, but what we would be doing is taking those people from those markets and using the local talent, the local subcontractors here in Nacogdoches to put together the, uh, the uh, competitively, uh, or uh, to put together the construction management at risk <coughs> proposals. Uh, we save time and money. Uh, basically, uh, the CMs are involved before the costs are established, uh, and also they review the uh, documents from the architects and the engineers, and they catch opportunities. They may find something in our designs, and they say, hey, why don't we look at this another way? And we're, of course, very open to that. We, we've worked uh, with many, many construction manager at risk uh, projects, so, so we're very much used to that. Uh, there is also input into the subcontractor selection process. So the owner, yourselves, and uh, the architect also have input that we can make into the selection process for the subcontractors. Also, you get the construction management team you want to work with, and that's based on qualifications. We're not looking for the lowest price. We're basing that on qualifications because we don't have the overall price yet established of the contract. It's also... Uh, it doesn't cost a premium. You're not paying more for this process. But what you're doing is you're bringing that construction manager into the design process, which is a good way to work. I'm on page two now uh, at number 11. The CM at risk is cost responsible and competitive. So it is a competitive way to get your bids. Uh, your, your construction manager uh, is based on, the selection is based on uh, their qualifications, but when you're getting into the, all the subcontractors that that construction manager is getting the bids from, basically those are competitive bids, those are competitive proposals, and we will be present when they receive those bids and when they open those proposals. And the, the school district, you have every opportunity to accept or deny any of those proposals for whatever reason. Uh, it, there are lower uh, construction costs, basically, because basically we're aligning the scope to the budget that we have. And also, uh, not to mention what I've already said before, again, uh, is the uh, amount of savings that you can get back in, in this method. Uh, there's also a lower cost increase due to change orders on CM at risk project. So the team can uh, input and identify potential gaps in the documents. The CM at risk can provide faster project completion uh, because they're on board early and they can uh, suggest things to us such as uh, going out and pre-purchasing some items. So we would get bids on those items and then we could pre-purchase them. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing going on right now in the industry is that uh, air conditioning units, HVAC units, are very hard to get. Uh, the, the schedule of getting those units is, is, is basically getting longer and longer. So we're seeing uh, many, many uh, people gaining advantages by pre-purchasing a lot of this equipment. Uh, basically getting again with the CM at risk contractor and with their contract, they can basically purchase this equipment, they can pre-purchase it. So it's not on the site yet, but we'll, we'll have it on the site at a certain date when we need it. Uh, it doesn't require a uh, CM at risk. I'm on number 16 now. The CM at risk does not require additional staff. Uh, we're still using the same amount of staff uh, here uh, at Nacogdoches ISD. We're not going to have to hire a, a, a whole new staff to try to oversee this project. We're still going to be able to do all this. The architect will still be able to oversee what the co contractor is doing. And uh, number 17 on here, which is probably the most important thing, and I mentioned this a little bit, but uh, all savings will revert back to the owner at the end of the project. So uh, the construction manager at risk will basically do their final pay app and they'll come up with, uh, here's all the cost incurred in the project and here are any of the contingencies that are left because what we do is a lot of times is that we have contingencies for certain items and all those things will be returned to the owner. The owner also has the ability to audit the project in this process. And in a CSP or, or a, uh, a, a total true bid project, there, there are no savings. The contractor keeps all those savings to themselves.
Are there any questions first on, on that, uh, on those 17 items that I covered? I had a question on that sure. number one, just for clarification. Yes, sir. You're talking about qualifications. Does that include past history of construction companies that have done a good or not such a good job? Yes, sir. We, we will basically ask the, the contractor some questions, and I do have a, a packet here that this our request for qualifications, and it's got many, many questions in here that uh, the contractor will have, to, uh, will have to answer, but that certainly is one of those questions. And you also you add your, your own local experience with certain folks as well. So I, the question I have is when we talk about the owners, we have a lead owner, which is the superintendent the and, the and you have more you have experience in both ways <coughs> to do this and what's your opinion of this way well uh just like this the late sam raven once said there are two things before to watch them being made you cannot enjoy one is law and the other is sausage uh actually there's something else construction if you ever had a husband and wife try to build a, a custom built house <laughs> how easy that goes um, so we're in what I call the sausage making phase of, of a bond. Uh, and there are a lot of things that uh, uh, if you watch it being made, it's kind of hard to enjoy it sometimes. Um, I, I prefer this method for this reason. Uh, we're going through what we call the design phase where we're kind of dreaming uh, or the dream phase of what we want to have in our facility uh, in each of the projects and you're all aware of that. As we began developing the actual construction documents, and you're trying to put together the, uh, the cost of these dreams and whatnot, having these folks at the table at that time brings reality to it. Mm -hmm. And if you say you have X amount of dollars to do something, but the design and construction of it can be a little bit less than that, then that's what you're going to be paying for it. Because they compare to silver poles, you, 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 develop, you develop your dream and put it out there and say, I hope someone can, can build it for that amount of money. And then you get a, 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 a sealed bid of what they say it's going to cost to do that based upon the, the construction uh, person, okay? And typically, they would do all they can to meet that dollar amount. Uh, and what typically happens is you get in there, and they'll say, well, if we had done it this way, we could save money, now it's gonna cost you more than what, what we anticipated. So that's when the, the uh, ahas pop up with the CSPs, more so than with the CM at a risk proposal. So I like this a lot. Things, the university has already identified their construction <laughs> person and they're at the table during the design and construction document development phase as well. Excellent. I'm gonna have one question, I may be <clears throat> jumping ahead. Um, you did a wonderful job of describing the construction manager at risk process, so thank you for that. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely a proponent of that, that process, many of the reasons you mentioned there. My question um, on, on the summary, we're looking at this for, for four items, the press box at Dragon Stadium, the new MLI Carpenter, uh, McMichael Middle School renovations, and the Malcolm Rector CTE and CTE renovations. Is it the, are you envisioning that this is one construction manager at risk on all four of those projects? And this may be your question, I'm not sure. Or are we looking at, we may have two handling you know some subdivide subdivision of those projects well, right now we're looking at one uh, i think but uh, the bid package itself makes it more attractive uh, you don't have a whole lot of teams here in east texas and so to attract uh, 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 the team with the capacity you want to put package your projects together Agreed. and whatnot um, so that, that's what we're looking at right now is having one person for yeah. these these four projects all right so the goal and and i asked that because i agree with that and okay. the way they were bulleted out i wasn't 100 percent sure but mm -hmm. i think that you do stand to attract a, a very competitive um, group of, of vendors doing it that way and it allows you also thank you for that question uh, it allows you also to work on your construction schedule and they can can move in, in in town stage things one time and just schedule these projects to where they fit with each other as well as the subcontractors also because they're, they're controlling the project on, on our behalf so they can schedule the subs a little bit better and, and attract your subs because it's easier to have them come in and set up shop one time for the project than to say come here for this phase now come back for this phase, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right. Mm -hmm. Additional questions at this point? All right. Did you have more for us, sir? I've got a lot. 
<laughs> because in case you had any questions, okay. Um, it can be a very confusing process. It, it, it can a, be, a good job. unless you live it like yes. I do. <laughs> um, there, there is on the fifth page, just point to you, and I won't read it out for you unless you want me to. Uh, the fifth page, there is a, a CM at risk versus CSP, basically their purchasing concepts and how basically you can look at uh, how CM uh, at risk differs from the competitively sealed proposal slash bid process. And then also the next page is basically looking at the different the differences between the CM and the CSP, uh, if you'll pardon all the alphabet soup here, um, and, 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 and looking at where the, the CSP, uh, which is the standard bid process, has a few things that basically they cannot provide through that project uh, or, or that process. Uh, one big thing is, again, the buyout savings. Uh, you, you're maximizing control over the final cost. Uh, as well as you're minimizing the cost risk to the district mm -hmm. through doing that. And I've got more I can go on and on, but uh, I'd, I'd like to hear any more questions at first to see uh, where anybody has any, uh, any ideas or, or, or any questions uh, for this. I, I just, I had a question regarding like, you make, they make an estimate of the amount that they're going to charge for the construction in terms of like materials, for example, steel. Yes, sir. If that price of steel goes up, do we have to adjust that well, when they do the contract? They, when, when they lock that cost in, when, when they get those costs and they lock that cost in, then that doesn't go up once they lock that cost in. And that, that is a really good question because that's something we're battling right now. I'm doing a $120 million high school uh, in Houston, and we have, we're, we're battling that problem uh, is the steel cost because the steel costs just keep going up and up and up. Steel and concrete. Mm -hmm. Yes, the sir. Right now. Absolutely. <clears throat> Additional questions, thoughts, or discussion on this? Thank you. Let's go. Mr. Savage. Let's go. <laughs> yes, when do we Mr. start? Thank you. Mr. Savage, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. No had you not been here, I can assure you we would have had some convoluted questions. So, uh, I was ready for, for it. Yeah, thank you for being here to, to and being well prepared. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. You know, I may ask one more. Um, what, what, what's your expectation on the number of uh, proposals we may receive off this uh, being in East Texas? I mean, I'm sure we'll get, I probably think of two off the top of my head, but. When I think about um, what the university just went through, <laughs> while, while, we, while we are, uh, uh, I'm gonna, when I think about the, the teams that can actually do this type of work, I'm familiar with, we have four or five, perhaps, I can think of out there. Uh, I know. I know we'll have at least one local. Yes. We've already made that plain, and, and, and I welcome that, that, that consideration. But there are some other teams out there that I've worked with in the past, and some I haven't worked with in the past, or heard about that. I think we'll look at this project now that it's packaged this way, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and and when they see that we have the capacity uh, to, to pay them, they'll, they'll like that. Uh, and also the fact they see that they'll be at the table uh, with the planning. Uh, it takes some of the, the risk and mystery out of it for them, as well. So. <clears throat> Let's see, that takes us to item, let me flip my page here, 3B, consideration in a, uh, of the order authorizing the issuance of school tax bonds. Mr. Fraley. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Clarence Gray, who's our financial advisor from RBC, coming up to speak as well. Basically what this is, and you've done this, this before, where you're setting up a uh, parameters in which we will look at the market and find the best time to go to market with the sale of the bonds. Basically, that's what this is. Mr. Greer. Yeah, so good afternoon, uh, Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Fraley. Uh, I think you're exactly right but, um, in terms of what the parameter that would be placed before the board on the 21st. Here's a draft copy of what we wanted to share with you, just a, um, the first few pages, like to walk through with the board to kind of understand 
exactly what gives you the authority to, to access this type of sale. Um, and on page one of the of the book, uh, which is overview of the existing uh, existing INS, that's the interest in sinking fund debt, as you know. Uh, right below it, you have after you made you made a payment on the 15th of February. So after that payment is made, your total existing debt is like 23 million 210,000. And um, this past November, you obviously had a successful bond election for 77 million 995 thousand dollars, which is over 100 and $1 million to some change you'll have. And the reason why I go through that uh, exercise is because you have to have at least $100 million in existing and or, uh, you know, to be sold debt, authorized by an issued debt, to be able to exercise this ability for what we call a parameter uh, resolution that the board adopts. And what a parameter uh, board uh, resolution is, you can see that the lower uh, at the bottom. Uh, basically what the board does is uh, it, it gives, it delegates uh, the board's authority to the superintendent and the CFO which are deemed as the pricing officers and certain, uh, assuming certain parameters are met when you sell your, your authorization, uh, the $77 million of bonds, um, we could do that in a very flexible, uh, timely manner without having to coincide it with your board meetings. And so, and so um, it, as you know, the, the market's been fairly volatile. One day it's up significantly, another day the bond market is down and vice versa. This will give the, the district and the whole entire financing team the most uh, flexibility. So, okay, now is a quiet time to be in the market. We also look at other, uh, some of the other uh, similar schools that that uh, maybe larger transactions we might want to go with. This gives you more flexibility. Obviously, we will reconcile that against the construction schedules when you actually need the money in order to start paying your uh, your, your purchase orders. So um, that's what a, uh, a resolution is in terms of the broader context. And and, and while Mr. Fraley is correct, you know his experience at, at Katy and other districts have lent him the uh, opportunity to utilize that because he was over 100 million. You're just now over the threshold, so this is something new. So he asked me to come in and talk to you a little bit more exhaustively about it before the Thursday meeting. If I could add, I know we talked about 4.5% uh, as the top rate and the markets at last time were like below, below that. And so worst case scenario, we would be selling them at the price that we had identified as potentially in the bond. But we think that we can do a lot better than that. And so we're not going to ask for any parameter above what we'd anticipated. Uh, but uh, it's just, just the technical term of, of giving us that, that authority to, when the market is right, we, uh, we make our move. And RBC has resources to optimize that a whole lot better than I do. And they'll monitor that and he'll make a phone call to me and, and Ms. Barwick and I will talk about that. And if that happens the day after a board meeting, then we gotta wait another month before we can make uh, uh, anything official happen. Uh, but if it happens, and within those parameters, uh, then I'll some, you know, uh, give you a heads up that this is what we're, what we're doing, and what we can make that sell then and capture the best opportunity within the market. And to that point, the next page, we summarize what we are expecting in terms of the structure of the bonds. And to the, to the left side um, of the page, you can see that we, we're expecting a all-in true interest cost somewhere between uh, 3.9 to 4, maybe a little bit more, 4.1 percent. So uh, maybe for a quarter, it's so so volatile, it's hard to um, project. But we want to give you an idea of what the range would be as in terms of a snapshot today in today's market. So that that's very very consistent, and it makes sense because if you think about the roller coaster the equity markets have been on absent the last you know two weeks when it's rebounded a lot of people pulled those assets over and deposited it into some bonds more safer right. return on principal and and it was they're okay with you know, not uh, making double digit returns you just want the return of capital not, not necessarily the return on capital uh, and so we're seeing a lot of inflows as a result of that but um, certainly to the right you can see you know, this is the index that kind of tracks where we are in today's market. Um, you know, we are pre and, in, and we reconcile that against where your outstanding debt is sold relative to that index. 
and you can see that you know when you when you sold your 2010 bonds, the blue line represents the index. It's above where uh, the index is today. And when you did your two refundings, as you would expect, since you're refinancing existing debt, you, though it was below below um, that uh, you know, the, uh, the current rates that we see today. So, um, and we're right on top of um, where we are, you know, in terms of the, the, the that orange line is the 425, where the index is, the 423. And so we're pretty much right on top of that, kind of projecting it a little bit better than that. And the reason why is because, you know, this index is a single A uh, index, and you'll be selling bonds with the protection of the permanent school fund guarantee, which lifts it to triple A. So this is um, not truly indicative of the rates you'll be able to receive, given the fact that you'll be higher, you know, high, highly rated based upon the guarantee of the state of Texas. And to uh, Mr. Fraley's point, in terms of the, the criteria, the resolution that Bond Council has um, yeah, circulated to you, you know, we kind of try to give you uh, some cliff notes, if you will. That's a pretty voluminous document. And so it kind of boils down to three major points in addition to what I just reviewed where the pricing officer would be Mr. Fraley and, and the CFO, uh, you know, one or two, the, both of those have the, have the authority to, to sign and execute, provided that these three parameters have been met. And uh, one of them is more of a technical term, which is basically the, you can't sell bonds at a deep discount, or we're selling bonds at a premium. So we meet that test and in, in based on the current structure that we just reviewed. The second one is what, um, uh, Ms. Fraley was alluding to, which is uh, the maximum rate allowed under chapter, uh, you know, the state statute, which is 15%. Obviously, we wouldn't, you know, look at that as a as an option. We would come back to the board if we're materially above four and a half percent. You know, we would we would at least reach out, let people know, hey, they, you know, we were targeting something a little lower. This was happening. And so, you know, we do have a, a meeting, uh, FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee's meeting coming up in March. General indications that the Board of Governors are looking at rates, leaving them alone because we're still in negotiation, haven't finalized the, the negotiation with, with, with China. You don't know what's going to happen with tariffs, kind of speaking to construction inflation that could help, kind of help or hurt us. Could also have an impact on your rates as well. So we just can't, got to keep a, um, a look on that. But then also, we you have to make sure that we're not spending beyond what the voted authorization, except for qualified costs which is a great thing that state legislature allows us to do, is that we can pay all our bond costs and one of the costs which is uh, capitalized interest without going into the voted authorization. So what we're delivering to the taxpayers, to the district, is exactly what you voted, you know, what the taxpayers approve. And so uh, one of the bigger items, which is the capitalized interest, which allows you, buys you an extra year or so before you actually have to levy a tax in order to impact a, um, the, the, the taxpayers, um, the bill. And that way you can kind of, they can see the progress made before they start seeing increases in their bill. Uh, I, you know, alternatively, when we sell the bonds, you take delivery, all of a sudden that full impact is, you be, would be born. And, and their share in that would have been spread over $6 million. But what you're doing is say, okay, you know what? Interest rates are low, let's give them some time to breathe. It's been a while since they've, had a bond election, this kind of gives you uh, some time for them to, you know, see what, what you're building and uh, before, and, and then let them know what's to come. And we're working with your staff to kind of moderate that, try to do it over several years, two to three years before you reach, <coughs> reach the maximum tax rate promise, which as you recall, was the 38 cents. And so um, on page five, you can see a graphical representation of what we're doing. The dark blue line is where we are right now. We had an election, it was successful. We got the, and so we're gonna sell right now all of the voted bonds in one sale. We work, we worked with your um, your architects, and you know they and, and they've assured us that there's a reasonable expect, expectation that uh, you know there's gonna be a plan. Where Eighty-five percent of these bonds would be bond proceeds would be spent in three years. Certainly, um, that, that, that seems like it's achievable. You know, that's the major threshold, tax threshold, that we have to be mindful of. And, and at least that, that seems like it's well within your, your purview. Um, you can see that orange line right there is at the 38 cents. We were there. 
But just so you know, it's uh, very conservative planning for your CFO, no tax rate, no tax value increase um, beyond um, years three, four, five. Well, actually, three, four, five, and beyond, no, no value increase at all. And so that's very conservative. And so to the extent that we're able to get some, some major, you know, what I call major, like through two, three percent increase, we may be able to, you know, not go to the full 38 cent. We may also could bring back an offset and say, you know, let's pay off some of the debt earlier, you know, by going to 38 cent. So you're going to have some options here as their values go above what uh, we projected, up, which is basically holding flat. So this is, you know, very, very conservative plan. I could add something here. Uh, this is something I was very pleased when I got here to see that Mrs. Fish and the board was already involved with uh, NETCO in the chamber and uh, trying to do things to really increase uh, the value, investments and values around the community. And the more we can increase the values, again, Mr. Greer pointed out, we have based this on no growth, uh, taxable value growth, which we know that should not be the case. Mm -hmm. right. So we're looking at a worst case scenario, but to the degree that we can increase uh, uh, taxable value, especially on the commercial side, then we should see uh, uh, less need to have uh, uh, the full tax rate increase that we projected on uh, individual property owners. It's not a promise, not a guarantee. It's all driven by can we increase uh, uh, values on the commercial side to offset uh, uh, the impact on the individual taxpayers. And so, that's why your district gets involved with the chamber and NETCO, because the more we can impact business development in our community, the better it is for our taxpayers in terms of the school district. And then I'll jump back to the previous page, which is the calendar on page four, in which kind of brings us to full circle of where we are today, which is kind of sets us up for Thursday on the 21st. Yeah, you know, there's no question we, I'm here to address, but you know, assuming that it gets placed on the consent agenda, or if you need me to come back, I could definitely do that on on Thursday, and it gets adopted. What we will be looking at next major milestone is to talk to Moody's and S and P. So while we have the guarantee, we still have to have our underlying ratings as though we did have our guarantee. And so right, and so we, have, I think you're going to do very well. You have a lot of things very positive. One of the major challenges that you had in the past, you've already overcome, which is, you know, the willingness to pay um, a tax in terms of a bond election. So that's going to be a great news. We'll be able to explain to the um, to uh, Moody's and SAP. We anticipate that being on the 28th in Dallas, and then you can see the schedule. Uh, we will be um, sort of uh, targeting, assembling a, an underwriting pool where, you know, obviously is is the financial advisor, we, you, you would need an underwriter, and we uh, recommend that you pre-select your underwriters you know, uh, with, with some local uh, participation to allow you know, some of your uh, supporters to become bondholders and stakeholders. And so I think uh, Mr. Fredley has a syndicate in mind that he will probably share with the board as it relates to uh, ultimately who would be responsible of talking directly to investors and, and we'll be working with them, ensuring that you, we get you among the lowest interest costs available at that proper time. And we anticipate the, a closing, a successful closing uh, at the end of April. And we'll come back to the May board meeting to report the results. If all holds, you know, this would be the schedule that we would be working with. Are there any questions? Um, I'll be here to entertain. A Any very, questions you very may have? thorough presentation. Thank you. You've covered all the bases well. You know, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. So, and, and the main thing is that you couldn't have done this before because we weren't going for the hundred million dollar threshold of having bonds to sell. So, and having that allows us to seize this opportunity yeah. parameters, and I think it makes us more attractive on the market as well. And I, we think our bonds will sell just like that. Yeah. And we're going to be allowing some local uh, folks to sell bonds to the local investors first in the batches, I think it's for $5,000 batches. Yes, sir. Each. So we've identified some folks we'll work with here locally to give them, them the first shot at their uh, their clients. And they may sell, you know, maybe a million or two of them, and then we'll put the other $75 million on the market, and that will be out there that long. All right. Excuse so me. it sounds then like <coughs> you hit something that's kind of important. I think locally there's a lot of mm -hmm. interest, and I know mm -hmm. a lot of local support for it. So mm -hmm. they'll have, I think I just heard you say, I want to reiterate and make sure I'm correct, is they'll have first shot before it ever exactly. hits the other bond market. And if we buy up 3 million locally, the rest will go. Or yep. There's not going to be a limit locally. Right. 
Right. That's, that's correct, I believe, right? I mean, Absolutely. You know, we can we don't care who buys them. Rooms there and, <laughs> and, and, and some of your peers even kind of expanded before, beyond that and say, you know, not even just the retail investors, but any any company domicile in in the county, we're going to give them first uh, swing at the bat. You know, and so we just get the zip codes, we write it up, and that's the, those are the rules. And and um, I think I think that that serves the taxpayer very well. Very nice. Now, once they see the interest rate, they'll probably say, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> some may, some may be that. Hey, it is a good, safe investment. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, they, they, selling, say, yeah, they want to help you, but they're like, well, my 4% for 30 years is pretty. Mm. Well, selling, and selling all the bonds at one time allows us to, to deposit those bonds and get some proceeds. But it's driven by having the aggressive construction schedule that we have. I mean, they would tell you, I want everything done last week. <laughs> uh, 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 realistically, uh, we're on pace, I think, to do a very good job of getting projects out of the ground. Uh, but again, this is the ugly period where we're doing a lot of sausage making. A lot of sausage making. Yeah, uh, if we could not sell the three, if you couldn't meet that threshold, we wouldn't be standing here recommending it. Right. Because the, the IRS, the, the implications are that the bonds could potentially turn taxable. Ooh. There's audits involved. I've never seen that. I've been doing this 21 years. Um, but you still don't want to have that, you know, over you like that. So um, we, we've worked with the, your, your tax council and bond council. Um, we've worked with and, and, and reached out to your, you know, your, your architects. And you, it sounds like you have a reasonable expectation that 85% of those bond proceeds can be spent in three years. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to, you know, they have to be allotted. You don't have to have a schedule. You don't have to necessarily be out the door, but at least there's a schedule for it. And so there's some yeah. flexibility in interpretation. So I mean, I mean, I mean it's confident. Okay. That, that this was um, something that you definitely can achieve without jeopardizing, you know, the, the tax status of the bonds. Right. Very good. And you're, you sound like you're very optimistic that we will come out with a higher rating after the Moody's visit. Well, let's right. look at that. You know, uh, on page on page six, you know, we we looked at the the, the where you are is uh, we. Uh, upper medium grade, mm -hmm. which is A1, A plus. And with the uh, guarantee of the, the, the permanent school fund guarantee, we're AAA. And that's what I was speaking to. But I still am optimistic of your ratings. I think given all the positive economic activities, when you look at what the, some of the weaknesses that they're talking about, I'm not so sure that they're on the table anymore. I mean, we have, we've had a, bond, a successful bond election. So we can, you know, we can, we're gonna make that argument in Dallas. You take that off the table. Um, you know, you, 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 there's nothing you can do about the, the, the social economic indicators. That's more of just something that's just reflective of the environment. But as you're growing your economics and your industry, that, you know, that's always a positive as an offset. And so I think you, and you're, you're they were very concerned about, you know, dipping into the financial reserves. But I think that your, your CFO's done an excellent job of, of holding that at bay, even with all the pressures you had on the capital side. Now that those you have the, a pool of money to address the capital needs, it should be you don't have the same pressure to, to um, exactly. access those operating reserves. So that we, so there are a lot of strong arguments here, um, you know, to to put upward pressure. So hopefully we can at least change the outlook to positive. What they like to see is three years of positive, um, you know, trends before they actually give us the increase. It's a major jump to go from single A to double A category. Um, but you're right there. I think this is the first step, and that's why I think you know we recommended a face-to-face -to -face to, because you do have so much positive momentum. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's going to be more impactful because about 20% of the rating is based upon management, yes. so it's just subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So if they've never met your management in person, you know I think that that <coughs> definitely could. Um, and in the policies that management has in place, too, so we'll be talking to you about that as well. But I think you're going to show very well in Dallas. Very it's good. a great story to tell. Very good. I'm thrilled that we're doing a face-to-face -face and very confident that it will be successful. That You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> and if I could add, again, that first weakness that talks about socioeconomic indicators, again, that's, again, why your school district must be involved in mm. economic development uh, uh, when your, your community. A lot of folks wonder to ask that question, but it's very important that we have this. Uh, there are many, many positive benefits to helping improve the socioeconomic outlook for our community, and the district has a role in that. Thanks, Thank brother. Greg, appreciate it. Sir. Any questions or concerns on this? Uh, he 
did mention in his presentation that we may consider moving this to consent agenda for Thursday. I think we still have leeway to do that. Am I correct, Holly? Yeah. <coughs> is that something you would be interested in? Yeah, I think we should probably sure. go with this first. Yes. Right. Well, let's move that, that item up to consent. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. <coughs> All right. That takes us to item C, consideration of the district-wide LED lighting project. Mr. Martin. Thank you, President Fitch. Uh, in your board book, uh, starting on page 212, uh, just going to recap uh, last month's meeting. We did take a look at a proposal from E3 Lighting. In your board book, or we've included a PowerPoint presentation, uh, the football field diagram, as well as a by board proposal and agreement. Administration is recommending that the board approve uh, district, this district-wide project of uh, LED lighting with E3 and also authorize the superintendent to execute the necessary documents which we've included as well in your board book. Just to bring it uh, back to the board's attention, uh, LED district-wide, uh, total cost not to exceed $1,524,663. Uh, our an annual energy savings are estimated at $174,570. Uh, our annual m and reduction on our stadium is about $25,000. Uh, there's some potential uh, encore rebates there. Uh, our return <coughs> on investment or our payback is about 7.5 years. Uh, a 20-year interior uh, warranty on our light lamps. Uh, also a warranty exterior of 5 to 10 years on our stadium lighting. Uh, uh, trustee uh, Dr. Groman did ask us to take a look uh, into uh, lighting the McMichael field, uh, of which we did, and the cost to, uh, to light that field was two, 225000 additional to uh, what the administration is asking for approval tonight. We did learn that uh, all of our games, junior high games, are now played in Dragon Stadium, and those lights over there at McMichael uh, have been turned off for the last two years. Uh, administration's recommendation at this time would be to uh, not light the McMichael field with LED lighting uh, until we've completed our plans for the junior high campus. Uh, answer any questions you all may have. Well, I just want to say that I know that when we had this presentation on the LED light before we were not in the position to be able to do that. But mm -hmm. since that time, I put LED lights in all of my house. <laughs> and it certainly has made a difference. Um, so I, I think it's not a, I think it's not a, a no brainer. I mean, if we, we can save money or we can spend money and I think we're better off saving, uh, saving money. There, there's something about certifying the poles or the poles are not certified or some word like that. If they're, they're not, then what is that going to cost us? Dr. Groman, um, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, we E3 did come out last week, and our polls are now certified. Okay, so, so they are ready it's a non-question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a question for us for a while, but we got it for a while. It's been answered, but we're all okay. good. I, I'm, I'm on board with all that. Just for <coughs> curiosity, the transformers used to be connected to the poles on the very top. Have they moved them to the ground yet? They have, yeah, if I'm yes. not mistaken, yes, sir. On both sides. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Okay. You keep up with us, don't you? <laughs> you're, you're very valuable. <laughs> yes. Can we move this to the consent agenda, too? We certainly may. We uh, have a, a we have a, a yes, suggestion that we move to cons this one to the consent agenda as well. Uh, so well so yes. Everybody agree to that? Yes. If you'll please make that happen. Ms. Right. Anderson, thank you. All right. No more questions? Making sure. One more time. All right. We'll move to item D, the first reading of TASB Policy Update 112. I believe this is Mr. Martin as well. Thank you again, Mr. President Fitch. Quite a big update. <laughs> it is a large update. Uh, this update is from uh, TASB, Texas Association of School Board, which includes both uh, legal and local uh, updates to your policies. Uh, you are 
The board is asked to, of course, uh, only vote on the uh, local policies for, for consideration of change. The, the process that we've used is uh, the policies were sent out to the different departments, department heads who are involved, and then we came in and met uh, on each of these policies and talked about them. Uh, the administration recommends making one minor change uh, to policy CV local, and that, that change would bring us in um, alignment with one of your current policies, CH local, uh, which basically states that uh, goods and services that cost $25,000 or more. So back over here in CV local, we are, that administration is recommending that for construction contracts valued at or above $25,000, dollars we're, we're, we're just uh, recommending that we match those policies up with the dollar amount. Be happy to entertain any questions what you may. What page is that one on? That is on 639. Any questions or concerns? Uh, and Mr. Fraley, I believe the 25,000 mark is still well below the, <coughs> what the state authorizes, I believe is 50. Are you comfortable with the 25? Well, uh, I'll tell you, staff uh, likes to have it at, at, at the higher amount, uh, just to be uh, expeditious. Mm -hmm. And everything we do, we're gonna come back and, and make sure the board's aware of it anyway. So that you're not gonna, you won't get too far out there. So. If the board is comfortable, then that totally is your, your call. Um, and with this being a local policy, when you lose comfort, you can change it <laughs> uh, at any time that the board so, so chooses. So I know for, for a lot of things, we can move faster with the higher authorization. Uh, my practice has been to give you all heads up anyway as we walk through several things already. That's my practice. I think that anyone you want to hire when that time comes, um, communicate that expectation. Of, of heads up before things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a phone call and conversation is a lot more efficient than having to wait till the next cycle of, of a board meeting. It's not where to happen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Are there any thoughts totally, totally or feelings your discretion. on that? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we can increase it just like we're doing it now in the future, just mm -hmm. Post it and then do it. It takes two meetings to do it. Correct. All right. Any other questions regarding the policy update? I was reviewing it <coughs> pretty diligently. <coughs> do we offer uh, cybersecurity courses as an elective <coughs> course for coming years? Not this time, no, sir. We're not. I will say it's on the radar screen for me yes, personally. Uh, I think this is a growing area, and I don't see why we can't give our students an opportunity to, to, to get involved in that market. Yes, sir. Good idea, sir. <coughs> Any other thoughts or concerns? I know there was a lot to digest, a lot of policy to read there, so I want to make sure that we, if we had any questions, we have ample time there to, to discuss it now. I do have one question. There's a lot of times it have 10,000. They mark it out and put 10,000. Why? And th throughout all the other higher part of this, does that make any sense? They put. They just put the same number. They just took it from blue and to. I mean, from red and turned it to blue. Uh, the explanation for that is because it is a local policy, and that's what the board currently has. It, it can be. Uh, raised, as Mr. Fraley was talking earlier, just like with CV, local uh, state law is the ceiling is fifty thousand, uh, but the board's current policy says ten thousand. Yeah, I wasn't looking at this the, this one on this right here, but in the all the other and all the other one twelve, mm -hmm. a lot of times it's like it goes from a capital I to a small I, you know, on internet. It seems, yes, it seems. Well, I don't understand it, but that's why I'm, I'm just asking a question. It's, it's some legal snafu stuff. Yes, sir. So Internet's gone to a capital I. It's gone to a Proper. small I. Oh, it's gone to a small I. Okay. <laughs> yes. That makes more sense to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
All right, hearing no additional questions, we'll move on to the next section on our agenda, which is executive session. The board will now conduct an executive closed session to discuss the items posted on our agenda, pursuant to the following provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act and as allowed by Texas Government Code sections 551.071, 551.072, 551.073, 551.074 and 551.129. No voting will take place in closed meeting. Today's session is discussion only. It is now 1.15 p.m.
Seven. Make a motion that we adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Winslow. On behalf of Reverend Irvin, I second. <laughs> there you go. We are adjourned. All right. We're going to start another meeting here now. Yes, yes.